Most sports in the Olympics are really pretty easy to watch. You cross a finish line, you hit a target, jump the farthest, or score a point. But fencing is really different. It's so incredibly fast and precise that even after watching several matches, for the average viewer, it's hard to understand exactly how a point was scored. This is footage from three different bouts at the 2015 World Championships. Now, on the surface, they look pretty similar. But what you're looking at is, in fact, three very different events. There's the foil, a pay, and the saber. They each have their own weapon and set of rules, and their roots can be traced back centuries. Now, my only cultural reference for fencing comes from the 1998 remake of The Parent Trap. Fencers ready? On guard! So I decided to travel two blocks from our New York City office to a veritable fencing oasis in the middle of Times Square, the Manhattan Fencing Center. It's produced three Olympians just this year. That's me, struggling. That's my very patient coach for the day, Brando Messinese. Perfect, very good job. Retreat, retreat, parry, repost. But it all happens in a half a second. It happens pretty fast. So where did fencing come from? An early form of fencing for sport can be traced back to ancient Egypt. The fencing as we know it today derived from the European duel. The design of swords evolved from a defense and hunting strategy of cutting and slashing to thrusting, because it was far more deadly and effective. The foil is the lightest of the three fencing weapons, and it appeared around 17th century Europe as a practice weapon for the small sword, a fashionable weapon often used in a duel to settle disputes. Around this time, fencing schools were established in Italy, Spain, and France, elevating the practice to a form of art and exercise. Foil fencing rules are the most limiting. You can only hit the torso and back and only with the tip of the foil blade. This is where the term touche or touch comes from. Touche. In the 19th century, a sturdier weapon called the épée was introduced. I would say for a first time viewer of fencing, the easier one to see is an uh, épée. That's because it's the slowest of the three events due to the whole body being a target area. Fencers are more hesitant to initiate an attack, exposing their whole body to their opponent. It is also the only of the three weapons where the right-of-way rule is not enforced. What's the right-of-way? Well, in a classic duel, the only way to win if you're being attacked is to parry or deflect your opponent's weapon and then repost or attack your opponent. With the épée, simultaneous hits can occur and both fencers will receive a point. And now, the fastest event, the saber. A saber is the second fastest uh, sport in the Olympic Games after the rifle shooting. That means the blade is moving almost as fast as a bullet. Instead of just thrusting, the saber fencers can score on any part of the upper body with slashes and thrust. And because the right of way is in force, saber fencers are more incentivized to attack first. You'll immediately recognize the difference between an epee and a saber bout because of the shape of the handguard and the speed of play. Fencing holds a special place in Olympic history because it's one of only five sports to be featured since the first modern games in 1896. It was a hugely popular sport. In, until the 30s, fencing bouts, like boxing, would take place in theaters. This, of course, is where the salute comes from. In the mid-20th century, electricity replaced red chalk to make judging easier. And between the 1900s and the early 2000s, many fencing maneuvers further distanced the sport from its dueling roots. Nothing did that more than the flick. People were used to be able to flick their blades on the back of their opponents, but then they changed the timings on the machines and then wouldn't work anymore. Because a flick was so quick, it's less likely to register as a hit. Despite that, fencers still attempt this maneuver today. The International Fencing Federation and the IOC have done a lot to try and draw outsiders to the sport. At London 2012, the lighting systems alone look like a techno dance floor, and the masks closely resembled Daft Punk headgear. But the essence of the sport, a fight between two people, remains. If you can just train your eye to watch split-second bouts, it's really pretty exhilarating to watch. 
Duels were formally banned by the 1920s across the entire world, but in 1967, two French politicians, Gaston de Fer and René Rubière, decided to call a duel over a dispute they had. They used the épée and the duel took place on a private estate. And the épée that they're using actually still has a pointed edge. It was a dueling sword. René suffered two wounds he lost, and of course, because of that, Clearly, the first blood-drawn rule was still in use.